A very, very warm welcome to the Pan Disability National Hustings, which brings the Scottish election that matter to them. Let me run through the partners involved in putting this together. We have the National Autistic Society, Scottish Autism, the MS Society Scotland, Enable Scotland, Leonard Cheshire Scotland, Sense Scotland, RNIB Scotland, Sight Scotland, and the Health and Care Alliance Scotland. So thank you very much for organising this exploration of political party policies from a pan-disability perspective in the run-up to May 6. We'd like to welcome our BSL interpreters, Helen Dunapace and Mark Cross, and electronic note takers, Andrina McMenemy and Mel Melanie Coulter, who are generating closed captions. You'll be able to use those. I, I hope you've been given instructions as to how. If you haven't, I'll tell you how to let me know. Um, but let's give them a helping hand um, panel, if we can, by speaking as clearly as we can so that they have a chance of keeping up. We have a Twitter account, which is hashtag disability voice. Let's use it and share some of the, the uh, responses to what we're going to be hearing, um, because this is a vital issue, isn't it? No specific dates yet but keep your eyes open and I'm sure you'll get told or uh, stay alert and I'm sure you'll get told. In a moment we're going to meet five prospective MSPs. They'll start by highlighting their party's key commitments to disabled people and uh, there's a website um, where uh, all accessible versions of the party manifestos have been collated. That's going to be listed in the chat function. I'll tell you more about that in a moment but the address is www.inclusivecommunication.scot um, and after that it'll be over to participants to put their questions. Now the organisers of this hustings were inundated with questions in advance and it's just not possible to hear from absolutely everyone um, involved directly. However we've themed the debate around their questions and I'll be raising the points people want answers to on their behalf. There's a chat function on Zoom for questions that arise as we get underway. If you scroll down to the bottom of your Zoom screen, you will see a chat symbol and that opens up a panel to the side of the screen while it's on the top. Like a question, add a comment, or simply just follow what others are saying. As you'll see, we have the inclusive communications link up there already. Um, so as you can imagine, there's a lot of ground to cover between now and 5 p.m. So I suggest we get going. First off, I'd like to introduce, please, our political panel. Um, and in no particular order, I'll, I'll, uh, it's really striking. Each has personal experience of disability. Um, so we'll be able to reference from personal perspectives as well as answering your questions. First up, we have uh, for the Scottish Liberal Democrats, John Waddell. Now, John is number two on the North East Regional list. His current day job is working as a communications manager for party leader, Willie Rennie. Welcome, John Waddell. Next, we uh, have uh, for the Scottish National Party, Neil Gray, who's standing in Airdrie and Shots, which is represented as, as an MP since 2015. At Westminster, um, Neil was party social security spokesman. For the Scottish Green Party, we have Gillian Mackay, a marine biologist by training. Um, Gillian's working in Holyrood as a parliamentary assistant, and she's standing on the Central Scotland list. For Scottish Labour, we have Pam Duncan Glancy. 
Uh, Pam is her party's spokesperson on social security. She's candidate for the Glasgow Kelvin constituency and is also on the Glasgow list. And then last but by no means least, we have for the Scottish Conservatives, Jeremy Balfour. Um, Jeremy's been an MSP since 2016. He's the party's disability spokesperson and candidate for the Lothian region in the 2021 elections. So please, let's welcome them all. And I'm sure if we could share a round of applause, they'd be getting one right now. Instead of the traditional two minute presentation from each of the politicians, we're going to go in with a, um, a question and basically ask each of them what difference voting for them might make to the lives of disabled people in Scotland. There's going to be lots of opportunity to get deeply or more deeply into other issues as we go through uh, today's discussion. But if I could start, please, I'm going to go in the order of, uh, in which I uh, read out the list. John Waddell for the Scottish Liberal Democrats. Um, would you tell us what difference voting for your party would make to disabled people in Scotland? Hi there. Thank you for that introduction. Um, I'll start by telling you just a little bit about myself. And uh, I'm proud to be standing for the Democrats. Um, because I'm going to ask you to make it really snappy because we're really tight. I will do. Yeah. Well, one of the reasons I want to start to tell you a little bit about myself is just that in the last couple of years in particular, I've been suffering from partially sightedness. And in my final year of uni, um, I had to deal with corrective surgery in terms of having a detached retina. And that's hugely informed my experiences in terms of living with disability and learning disabilities before that. But that's one of the reasons I'm standing and one of the reasons I want to put the case uh, for the Scottish Liberal Democrats, having more representation in well, Parliament of people you, with disabilities. Can you just outline for us, you know, give us three top bullet points, what three you top bullet points. Well, we, well, we want to put recovery first in this election. And for the horrible year that we've endured, we must make sure that the recovery is the prime focus of Parliament. And the reason for that is because I, I, I promise I am. Um, Please, I'm, yeah, we're really tight for time. I didn't say it at the top, but this is extremely snappy. So if you could give us what difference would, you, would voting for uh, the Liberal Democrats make for disabled people in Scotland? Well, well, those who have experienced the pandemic the worst are those who entered the pandemic with the greatest disadvantage. And people with disabilities are right at the top of that list. So we will champion education services that are inclusive for each disabled child and disabled young people to make sure that they can transition okay. to adulthood with appropriate Brilliant. care and support. In social care, we want to involve disabled people and other care users in the national standards and local commissioning so that Super. they are informed by local we'll talk experience. We'll about that later. So let's just take the headlines here. What do, you know. Experiences, uh, and we want to support the work of the Scottish Union of Supported Employment to ensure disadvantaged people and disabled people can get access to work and work with employers to encourage them to adopt flexible working arrangements. Okay, thank you very much. Now the next um, person I would like to ask that same question to is Neil Gray from the SNP. Neil. Thanks very much, Penny, uh, and I'm very pleased to be along here representing the SNP uh, at this crucial uh, hustings, and I thank all the organisers uh, for the work that's gone in to get this run today. I'm proud to be standing on a manifesto that commits to incorporating the UN Convention on the Rights of Dis Persons with Disabilities into Scots law. That will also bring forward a learning disability, autism and neurodiversity bill uh, that will also create a commissioner with the same title to help people with learning difficulties in autism. We'll create a national care service, introduce a new Scottish accessible home standard, build a fairer social security system with the powers that we have based on dignity and respect. It will deliver a new child uh, yeah. disability payment and an adult disability payment. And we will champion fairer employment by expanding reporting duties on employers, not just reporting on gender, but also on uh, the disability and ethnicity pay gap as well. Thank you so much. Very succinctly put. For the Scottish Greens, Gillian Mackay. Thank you for that introduction. Um, we also support the incorporation of the UN Convention on the Rights of Disabled People into Scots law. We'd like to ensure that disabled people benefit from the young person's guarantee and have a role in designing those employability support schemes. We'd like to recruit two and a half thousand more additional support needs teachers, having the current additional support need pupil to teacher ratio, ensuring that um, disabled young people have that support from education into training and then forward 
into adulthood and a review of disability assistance to examine the changes that are needed to ensure that the payments meet the six conditions established by the Scottish Campaign for Rights to Social Security. Uh, thank you so much. And as I say, there is an opportunity to get further into these issues as we go through this discussion. So next, let's hear from Pam Duncan Glancy of Scottish Labour. Pam. Thank you, and thank you so much for, for having me. Um, I got into politics to make life easier and better um, for disabled people. It's what gets me out of bed in the morning. Um, if you vote for Scottish Labour, um, we will strengthen your human rights by embedding the United Nations Convention on the Rights of Disabled People into domestic law, creating a national care service that's based on human rights, that's free at the point of delivery, and that pays the staff £15 an hour at least. We'll also make sure disabled people have enough money to live on by guaranteeing every disabled person who doesn't have a job and can work to get a job. And we'll also create a social security system that's there with human rights baked in from eligibility and assessment all the way through to payment. And that means paying additional funds to support disabled people to meet the extra costs of living as a disabled person and also ending the 50% and the 20 meter rule. Thank you so much. And again, we'll get, we'll get further into some of these. And as I said before, no means least, but last, in this particular um, round, we have Jeremy Balfour of the Scottish Conservatives. Welcome, Jeremy. Uh, thank you and good afternoon, Penny. And good afternoon, everybody. And thank you uh, for having me here uh, this afternoon. Three headlines. Uh, firstly, in regard to uh, benefits, we would make sure that they are devolved quicker to Social Security Scotland and um, so they can be run um, out of Scotland in, in a quicker way rather than waiting um, for the present time that the government is suggesting. Secondly, we will look at carers allowance to increase the money, particularly for young carers. And thirdly, uh, we will set up um, a wholly owned company uh, owned by the Scottish Government, uh, which will look to give jobs and give training for people with disability to help them back into employment because of all the consequences that's happened in the last 14 months. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, panel. And I'm sorry for pressing you on this, but I cannot tell you how many questions we have had in. And I'm really keen that those people's questions are the ones you answer. So I'm going to keep it cracking along. And sorry if I have to nudge it occasionally, but we've got so much ground to cover. So I was going to start off with a question, right? As we all know, disabled people have been impacted dis proportionately by the COVID pandemic, yeah? Deaths, rates of illness, withdrawn support packages, and challenges to their human rights. What would you do differently if elected to ensure that disabled people are never, ever again regarded as an afterthought? I'd like to start with Gillian Mackay there, if I could. Thanks, Penny. We have to ensure that ultimately disabled people's rights are taken into consideration and the, the, the needs of disabled people are taken into consideration when we're building any system within government. We've seen care packages withdrawn and not reinstated. That needs uh, restarted as a matter of urgency. We need care packages that are led by the people who need them so that they are built to support people effectively rather than the sort of one size fits all um, system that we currently have. And that's one of the opportunities we have through our national care service is to build that flexibility in, ensuring that um, people have access to work that ensures a basic standard of, of living for them as well. And a social security system that supports people. We'd like to see a universal basic income to ensure that everybody has that basic standard. How would that stop people from, you know, a, a, this massive group of people from, who basically felt very much as if they were the bottom of the pile? What would you do differently if, you know, there was another crisis? Um, you know, would you prioritise disabled people, Gillian? There has to be there has to be a prioritization for those who need the greatest support. We've seen that in the way that um, people who are more vulnerable to the to the pandemic itself have been prioritized in the way that we've taken and the approach that we've taken to public to public health. So in a sense, that needs to also be built into the way we support people in other aspects of their life economically and 
through housing, through many other aspects that we've seen impacted by the pandemic itself. Thank you very much. John Waddell, here's your chance to go deeper into your plans, okay? Um, how would you, how would you make sure that disabled people are not an afterthought in any planning? I think it comes down to, by and large, the, the systems that we create right from the beginning. So talking about education, just as an example, people drop off throughout the education system and by, by and large that tends to be disabled people who can't get the access to public services, can't get taken seriously and throughout life that means they have a harder time getting into work and they have a harder time getting into parliament where decisions are ultimately made. So making sure that early on in the education system that it works for people who have disabilities so that they don't drop off so that they can be heard later on, make sure that people who are in work are actually supported. And by and large, that means that we get a system so that people don't become an afterthought because they can then go on to be considered within the process. And when you think about the fact that um, like I said before, decisions are made by those who turn up. We can't have a system that excludes people because that's how they become an afterthought. They need to be right there in the thick of it. And we can't have a system that at the very beginning starts excluding people. So it's about making sure that in those very early years in education and in things like mental health, access to work, all those things that then build us up to a system where people get into parliament, get heard through things like lobbying that people can be there making their considerations heard so you asked there in the event of another pandemic should they be given you know extra care be listened mm. to i think the answer to that is absolutely, be a priority. yes absolutely you have to think about the people who are going to be most disproportionately impacted when it comes to these things we were careful when it came to shielding and particular care in terms of care homes didn't get it all right by any stretch of the imagination but we looked into areas where people were most vulnerable and we made decisions based on that and I think disabled people they don't always have the voice they don't always get the consideration that's required and if this ever happened again if ever there's another national emergency yeah. of any kind there should certainly be special considerations for people with disabilities. Thank you very much. Jeremy Balfour how do we make sure you're on mute sorry uh, I mean, I think, first of all, um, and I think there's cross-party agreement with this, we need to have a review of what's happened over the last 14 and 15 months. Things like care passages, as Julia mentioned, um, a number of people have been in touch with me about do not resuscitate notices. That whole area needs to be looked at, reviewed, and lessons learned. Uh, for me, the most positive thing that we can do going forward is there's no specific minister who has responsibility for disability in Scottish Government. It falls amongst different ministerial roles. And I, I think there needs to be a minister who part of their portfolio has disability on it. So that when these issues come up, whether it's in health or education or transport, there is somebody there who can articulate what disabled people need. And, and, and we've got to be careful here, Penny, because when we talk about disabled people, mm. we're not all the same. Yeah, so, uh, I'm this group in today Absolutely. that are people with lots of different disabilities who have lots of different needs, yeah. and so we need somebody there who can understand that within government, who can articulate that, and also the third sector and individuals can lobby specifically on because at the moment, you know, it's not clear who I go to within Scottish government yeah. to make my case, and I think that needs to be a lot clearer pathway. Thank you. We'll, we'll, we'll get further into that, but um, I just want to pick up a couple of comments. Nikki Denny is saying that those with invisible disabilities often feel left behind those with visible difficulties. So we, even within, um, you know, the community, uh, and she's saying this needs to change. And uh, Charlene Tate, in response to you, Jeremy, is basically saying, I think it's a whole portfolio remit, not a part of one. Right, okay, I'd like to take Pam's comments on that. You know, how do, what do we have to do differently to make sure that disabled people are never again an afterthought, as they certainly felt the last time around? Yeah, I mean, I mean, what's happened to disabled people during the pandemic is is utterly devastating. And um, what it shows to me is that um, the people who have been hit the hardest in the pandemic are ultimately the people who face the biggest and deepest um, inequalities before it. So we know that learning disabled people, for example, were more likely um, to die much younger than the non disabled people. Um, so inequalities in systems like that have been there since long before the pandemic. 
um, and the pandemic has actually entrenched them. So what we have to do differently is, and this is an, a, a classic example of why disabled people need to be in the room. And the way that we do that is by supporting disabled people to get out of bed in the morning with a national care service that is free at the point of delivery and supports their human rights. It's about making sure they've got housing that they can access. And it's about funding disabled people's organisations and organisations that support disabled people that are represented here today so that their voices um, are never ever again lost in the pandemic and, and never again Again, lost in decision making in, for example, a future pandemic. And the last thing I want to say, someone else mentioned lessons learned um, about an inquiry in the future. And of course, I think that um, I'm 100% support that inquiry. But one of the things I, I've noticed this time around is that disabled people are innovators by design. We have to be just to get out of bed in the morning. We should never lose the potential of that innovation. And that's why we need to have disabled people in the room, not just because it is the right thing to do, but because we will have that creativity and innovation that no one can afford to lose. Thank you very much and, and several of those points are going to get picked up later um, and uh, now our, our last representation on this particular question comes from Neil Gray. Um, I mean obviously the SNP was fully in charge and charged throughout this pandemic but do you think do you think there are things that we could have done differently to support disabled people? Yes, I think there are lessons that are going to need to be learned. And I think the First Minister has been the first to say that uh, that's going to need to be happening. There's going to be a public inquiry um, coming hopefully at the end of this year uh, in order to uh, garner the experiences of people, disabled people, older people and uh, others who um, felt that um, the response to the pandemic uh, wasn't as good as they feel it could have been and make sure that lessons are learned. And part of that for me is about making sure, uh, picking up on some of the points already made, two in particular, one around uh, social infrastructure that Gillian was talking about, um, a national care service, um, free at the point of use based on dignity and human rights, uh, ensuring that we have a social security system uh, as we uh, build uh, the, the new uh, benefits that the Scottish Government is taking control over. Um, and that links into uh, the second area that I think we can learn from, and that's the point that John was making and uh, others, to be fair, around agency. And that's making sure that people uh, with disabilities are, as Pam described it, in the room, um, you know, part of the decision making process. And in the building of the social security uh, system in Scotland, uh, the Scottish Government has used experience panels uh, to ensure that it is relevant to the, those who need it and use it the most, and that includes disabled people. So it's about ensuring that we have the social infrastructure right uh, and also that we have the agency right, that Thank people ha with disabilities have their voices heard. There will be a chance to, I hope there will be a chance, depending on timing, to get stuck into that deeper. But let's take a pre-recorded question from Kirin Said of Sight Scotland, who unfortunately can't be with us in person right now, but Kerry Ann MacDonald's going to press play and we'll take her question. Thank you. My name is Kirin Said. Although I am in my early 50s, and an Asian visually impaired woman, I experienced many difficulties in obtaining vaccines for COVID-19. This was one of many issues I came across during the pandemic, such as social distancing. We're constantly being informed that the government want to look after the vulnerable. And yet I felt left behind in recognizing that online systems and apps may not always be easily accessible to me. Would you consider consulting us from the outset, as well as having a more flexible approach in obtaining vital vaccines and other support? Often I feel the visually impaired community is one of the least considered in the disability world, and there should be more equity for all disabled people. Thank you for answering my question. Thank you very much. I mean, I, I think there, Kirin is picking up very much on where we left off. So, um, Neil Gray, I'd like to come to you first. You talked about experience panels, but you know, there's there's somebody that that's encountered um, real blocks. 
for her as she has experienced it. Uh, social distancing, Kieran mentioned, um, you know, that, that decisions are made on behalf of vulnerable people um, and not including them. Now, would an experienced panel necessarily make much difference to Kieran? Neil? Yes, I think it would, do, especially if it was, especially if it was inclusive. Um, and uh, certainly in my dealings when I was working pension spokesperson at West stakeholders that are involved uh, today um, to hear from them about the issues that were most important in terms of uh, the social security system being delivered uh, from Westminster and make sure that the, the, I was able to give voice to those diverse uh, needs and interests that Jeremy described rightly that not all disabled people are the same and the needs and uh, desires are often very different uh, and I think um, in terms of communication obviously the Scottish Government has been doing what it can to ensure that uh, during the COVID briefings that we are being as diverse as possible to provide as information to people. Uh, we have BSL interpreters in the room unlike the UK government briefings uh, and we also um, have ensured as best as we can to make sure that uh, we are providing accessible formats for the, the COVID information getting distributed. It is a challenge uh, to be able to make sure that we get that right uh, but it's important that we hear the feedback from the likes of uh, Karen who uh, put our question forward so well and I would hope that the, uh, going forward we can certainly learn lessons from uh, the areas that she has raised around communications being right. Thank you. Pam Duncan Glancy, uh, uh, you know, uh, Kieran there talked about not necessarily being able to use online systems and apps and you know what consideration is given to people for instance who who can't do that. Um, you know what's your perspective on how to personalize the kind of information and support that people might need because as we've all recognized disability is a huge spectrum it, i mean it, it really is and i guess what i would say is that experience panels um, are are so important but what's also important is the funding to disabled people's organizations to support people to to get their best to give their best to those experience panels and also to get the best out of them. So I, I, I very much support and our party supports particip participative democracy and the way that that, that that would be used in such a, the, the, in such a panel. I also think that, we, that we, need to, we need to be careful that we don't become tokenistic about it as well. And actually we, we're in danger of doing that when we start to just create panel after panel after panel, which I have to say I've seen a lot of recently. Mm -hmm. Um, then produce publications like the Field Report that hit them, that, that missed the mark, or um, the, the the disability strategy in Scotland that yet again missed the mark. We'll come back to that. <laughs> disabled people um, and to actually uh, not just listen to them and have them in the room, but actually um, allow them to lead the way on it. Um, and the experience, the experience that Kevin's just mentioned. And um, they're just now is far too common for disabled people. People make ridiculous assumptions about what we need um, and, and don't ask us about what we need. And that's incredibly, incredibly important. One last thing I want to say is um, that also, uh, as you might have seen in our manifesto, although I appreciate it's only just been published today, so you've not had much time to look at it, um, the, the, we, we will publish a national visual impairment plan that will look to get much, much more consistent service provision, for example, um, across Scotland and sustainable maintenance of um, universal access to NHS optometry. So I know that's not the only solution to things like that, but that's our, um, that's our offer, at least um, to try and support um, better access and services. Thank you. Thank you very much, Jeremy Balfour. You were nodding there in agreement with Labour's Pam Duncan Glancy. <laughs> well, <laughs> yes. Um, um, I mean, I, I do get slightly concerned, uh, Penny, that we have lots of talking shops, yeah. but very little action. And actually, my gut feeling is, is that if you if you went to the people on this panel and said, "What is it that you need? What is it in regard would make a difference?" The answer is there. It's now for us as politicians to implement that. And so I, I agree with Neil, yeah, it, it, panels are important, but I also agree with Pam, but sometimes they can be, we can be panelled out. And actually what we now need is actually action from politicians. And, and, and I, you know, I think we are very good at talking. We're not so good at delivering. And, and, and I am concerned that even going into this election in two weeks' time, you know, how many MSPs will have a disability? 
you know, I, I think there's been lots of good chat by all our parties, all five parties, for the last five years about delivering that. But will we deliver that? How many will make it? Will there be a substantial difference? And so I think what we now need to see in the next five years is a bit more action around disability um, and actually delivering what we all know people want and need. Yeah. Um, and we're particularly about that question. Thank you so much, Gillian. Uh, uh, lots of chat, you know, when are we going to deliver? What would the Greens do to turn all that theory into actual action? I think the points that have been made about um, experience panels are really important on both sides. We have to have that lived experience built in. There are, on the panel here, there are people with multiple different disabilities and multiple different needs. And the whole the whole point of experience panels is to build in those um build in those needs and that variety of opinion as to how people want to access these things. Um, ensuring that systems reflect the needs of disabled people, I think is massively important. And building those in at the start of systems, there are many systems that need overhaul to include disabled people more readily. But as we go forward, ensuring that disabled people's thoughts, opinions and rights are absolutely embedded at the heart of these, I think is something that we really need to work on. But absolutely, the action has to be at the core of that. Thank you. And John Waddell, for the final word on this one, um, you know, do you recognise this kind of implementation gap around, uh, yeah, we all know what we need to do, but it's actually doing it. I don't know how I could disagree with anything that's been said so far. I think the nail was hit properly by Pam. Uh, basically to say that we're very good at uh, putting together these kind of panels, but we're not very good at listening. And what we said during the pandemic repeatedly was that the support should reflect the needs and uh, the, the measures of the lockdown. And that was true in the pandemic, but it's true of all systems that we create. If we're going to put together panels uh, of lived experience, we need to make sure that those panels are diverse in those experiences. We also have to make sure that we're listening to what they say. And in that, that question that we've got there, the striking thing really is that the systems that have been put in place to support um, everyone during the pandemic haven't been road tested to make sure that they support the most vulnerable people in society. And that's yeah. quite staggering. So we need to make sure that we have these panels and that they're listened to, but we also have to go back to them as soundboards. Does this work? Are we doing the right thing? Um, will this work going forward? And Thank that's you. that's what we need to do when we're going, uh, Thank going you forward very with much. these kind of systems. With, there's no way on earth we're going to cover all the questions I've got written down here to ask you, but I'm going to read through one before we take another face-to-face -face question. This comes from Joyce Scott of uh, Scottish Autism, who has a 21-year-old son who's in a care home but can't visit friends and families at the moment because they face the same restrictions as care homes for older people. Um, she cannot fault the staff, but their hands are tied from government, she says. No one expected COVID. It's all new, but lessons hopefully can be learned from this. And one is to look at the way care homes are registered and the needs of each individual person. So we come back to individual needs and addressing those, which I think is still a huge challenge. Um, and she says they are very different to older people. So there isn't a question in there, it's a statement. Now, as you know, and we've had reference to it, I think we've had the independent review of adult social care in Scotland, otherwise known as the FELA report. This recommends root and branch reform of the way social care works. Um, creating the National Care Service directed by government with local authorities and local care partnerships operating in a very different way. That's their vision. We have a question from Lucy Mulvey of the Alliance for Health and Social Care Scotland on that. Lucy, are you there? I am here, Penny. Hey, Hi. Hello. Away. <laughs> um, thanks very much for the opportunity to ask a question. I'd like to ask the candidates, how will you implement the recommendations of the Feely report and ensure that a social care system based on equalities and human rights is delivered? Thank you. Thank you very much. We'll get round everybody. If you could make this really quick, because we've literally got a couple of minutes before we have to break. Um, John Waddell, um, your party, I think, is the only one that actually doesn't agree that we should have a national care service. Can you explain briefly why? It goes back to what we are just talking about there, about the experiences that we understand people have and who is best to feed into that. It's not entirely that we oppose it necessarily in principle, but that we're sceptical about the idea of a centralised system being the best way of looking out for people and their needs, but that those on the ground 
and that those with the experiences in their respective areas are the best people to implement national care. So we do want to make sure that we've got the funding and that we've got national standards in order to support um, uh, care and make sure that we don't go through the, the national trauma and emergency and crisis that we had over the last year ever again. But we want to make sure that those who are actually on the ground best qualified for the local needs of each area are able to do so. So having national standards and funding, but not a centralised national service. OK, thank you very much. And Jeremy Balfour, again, the Conservative Party, while it says it can deal with a national care service, doesn't want centralisation. So it's not the national care service that Feely envisaged, yeah? I, I, yeah, I mean, I think in many ways, the point John has just made would, would be similar. You know, I think we look at Police Scotland as a classic example of centralisation and we've lost that local. So here in, in Edinburgh, Lovin, where I live, we had an excellent uh, team set up that looked at burglaries and housebreaking. Police got and come along, got rid of it because it didn't fit into the national scheme. And we saw a massive increase in burglaries here in, uh, in, in Edinburgh. So what we need is national standards. We need to make sure that your expectation is exactly the same whether you live in Dingwall or Dumfries but I'm not convinced I want some bureaucrats running it out of Edinburgh or Glasgow. We need to keep that local uh, knowledge. We need to keep that local experience at the same time as delivering local services, um, which are the same across. But I'm just not convinced from my experience of Police Scotland that it would work if we had a national thing run out of central Scotland. Thank you. And Pam Duncan Glancy, I think I heard you say that you thought feeling was a mistake. No, missed the mark. Oh, thanks. Okay, yeah. cool. <laughs> thanks for explaining that. No, <laughs> Why? Why did it miss the mark? You know, what would you? What don't you agree with in it? So I think, um, well, first of all, it didn't involve enough unpaid carers, enough disabled people or enough care staff themselves. And actually, if we're going to design a system, um, and, and my goodness, we need to because social care is creaking at the seams. It has been for decades. Um, I, I have uh, campaigned alongside a number of people um, at, at this meeting today um, for this and have been doing it for a long, long time. Um, and it's taken until now um, to get a national care service across um, many of the national part uh, of the party's manifestos, which I'm really pleased to see. Um, the, everyone's kind of nervousness around the, the national part of it as opposed to the local provision. I can understand that, I really can, but I can also tell you that from direct lived experience and the, and the experience of other disabled people, if we don't put national standards in place, if we don't have a national care service like we have a national health service, people will be left to a postcode lottery. Um, it costs more in some local authorities than in others um, for your social care. Eligibility criteria is different in some local authorities than others. Sometimes you'll get help to get out of bed in the morning, you'll get help to go see your friends in one area and then you move to another area and you get nothing. Um, I've got my own personal experience, I could literally talk about that all day. So we really, really need a national care service, but crucially for it to deliver properly for the users of it and the people who work in it, it is going to have to be properly funded and that means proper funding to local authorities, it means proper funding to di disabled people's organizations again so that we can support um, that service uh, to be to be the best that it possibly can be and it absolutely has to be about delivering human rights disabled people don't just want care to live we want care to have a life and that's exactly what a national care service should be about delivering thank you very much Gillian McCall you're nodding your head in agreement with Pam there I think very much it has to be it has to be care to thrive not just care to survive and I think that's one of the one of the things we really need to embed in the in the new national care service. I, I can understand the um, the trepidation about nationalising a service, but we have the national health service and we have local health boards. There's no reason that a national care service couldn't work in a similar way. And I think protecting local accountability is something that that we need to do within the system. Care should not be about companies making profit because all that ends up doing is squeezing both the service users and those working within it and that's what we're seeing currently within the system that we have there are lots of okay. very dedicated people doing a wonderful job trying to help people thrive in the in the situations that that they're in but without without the the funding the ability and the and the time to be able to do that and that's one of the other major um, major problems with the current 
care services, a lot of the, the short visits or squeezes on, squeezes on time, changes in times people are coming in, all that sort of thing. Thank you very much. Neil Gray, the Feely Report identified real problems with the, cat, the role of local authorities at the moment, both as um, providers and commissioners of care, and that they identified as a reason for changing their role. Is it likely to be changed if the SNP retains power? Yes, um, and I thank Lucy uh, for her question. We uh, discussed this many hustings moons ago uh, on the health and social care at hustings right at the I think it was right at the start of the campaign um, and yeah we're, we're fully committed to uh, national care service it's as a central by he, uh, as described in the Feely report though specifically uh, yes I mean we're, we're this is going to be uh, discussed in the next parliament it's going to be established uh, based on uh, cross-party discussions um, to ensure that everybody has an input and you know I, I absolutely agree with the points that Gillian and, and Pam were making about making sure that uh, this ensures that uh, people who rely on a national care service are able to thrive and are able to uh, get on uh, but also uh, understanding the concerns that Jeremy and John have made around ensuring that the local provision uh, and the local input isn't lost and uh, the, that is going to be a difficult balancing act in terms of making sure that national standards uh, are maintained and brought up uh, particularly for ca social care workers, uh, having a, a national care wage is going to be, I think, revolutionary for the, the care sector and attracting um, new uh, care, social care workers and making it a career that is uh, more attractive. Um, it's been a major challenge to, uh, for many care providers to get access to, uh, to workers and to employees. And I think this is going to make a, a real difference. So this is something that's really exciting for me and I think is going to, make, is going to be a transformational change. Certainly, in my experience as a member of parliament, uh, ensuring uh, people with disabilities and care needs uh, were getting access to appropriate care packages was one of the key areas that I would deal with in my, in my, uh, in my casework surgeries. Uh, and so I'm hoping that this can help improve that for people who desperately need that okay. support. Thank you. We've only got five minutes before we have to take a break and move on to another subject area. And I have got a lot of words here and I've committed to reading them out. So here's a, a question from Laura Alexander of the National Autistic Society. I have both a professional and personal interest in autism. And my question is on the failure to support children and families in Scotland by the unacceptable time they must wait for a diagnostic assessment. Currently across Scotland, hundreds of preschool children are waiting well over a year and school aged children for longer. In some health board areas, the number of pediatricians working in child development was cut precisely as referrals rose before the pandemic. The numbers are harrowing to anyone who understands their implications. Lack of early intervention strategies, no access to support and understanding from education, finance and other service agencies. How does the panel propose to address this failure support and the needs of the child? I'm going to link this up with another um, couple of points. One from Eddie Mackay, Sight Scotland Veterans, who asks, why are people with sight loss not given more help when they're diagnosed and why is support variable across the country? And uh, uh, here's a question from Joan Kerr of RNIB Scotland. The future and reputation of Edinburgh Eye Hospital is under threat. The building's not fit for purpose and patients are anxious about future services. Will candidates promise to undertake a promise to fund a new eye facility in Edinburgh? I mean, that could be widened out and, and applied to, you know, any uh, service that, um, disabled people use they want to be involved if there's decisions being made and they want to be listened to and um but before we break i'd like to round that up into one question which is what you're going to do about terribly long waits be it for assessments be it for appointments that have been cancelled what we're going to do about the nhs and we've got three you've got 30 seconds each who pam <laughs> Okay, um, I'll be quick. Um, first of all, we need to grow the workforce because, um, as, as that question highlights, there are not enough staff um, in there. And that's also about making sure that we've got sustainable and a long-term pay deal for the workforce um, within the NHS and in education um, because there simply weren't enough there, uh, enough people there before the pandemic and there's certainly um, the, the people who are there now um, are burning out. So we need to grow the workforce. Well, so we would do that by making sure that we had more Scottish domicile places in medicine, nursing and other allied health professionals. We would also want to develop a national transition strategy 
um, with people's advocacy at the centre and improve outcomes for children and young people um, who had mental ill health. Um, on on a, um, a side to that as well, we would make sure that there was a mental health practitioner in every single GP surgery um, so that people could access it there. We would implement a no wrong doors approach. There's nothing worse than asking for help and being told this is not the place to get it. I'm so sorry that this is so quick. I know you know, that you're all passionate about this, but Gillian, what would you do to cut long waits, be it for assessments or treatment? Funding is always something that, um, that we need within the health service. Funding for, um, as Pam said, uh, staff pay more um, for support for staff. We've seen obviously high burnout rates during the pandemic. We need to address a lot of that through various levels of support that, that staff clearly need. Um, funding adolescent and child mental health properly is something that is, is hugely important. We've seen massive wait times for that. Um, funding for more staff for all the assessment places that you just mentioned that have been that have been cut in recent times as well. Thank you so much. I mean, it's it's a huge field. John Waddell, what would you do to address these anxieties about hugely long waits? Um, these are exactly the disabilities that I actually suffer from with learning disabilities and sight loss. So when I say that this is a top priority for us, I really mean it. We need to make sure that we expand the workforce and give them the resources that they need, both in terms of the mental health aspect, additional counsellors, but also an educational psychologist so that the weights have gone down. We need to make sure that they've got the resources that they need in order to get into the schools to meet the children who have those problems and also to make sure that the educational, uh, the education service is um, supported and inclusive um, so that in those early years people don't miss out on uh, on those strengths and the final thing I was just going to want to add there was on the eye pavilion um, I still need to go private for my eye care because the kind of technology that's needed to, to discover things like yeah. detached retinas isn't in the NHS yeah we need to expand those services and we need to fully fund them and I would always support any kind of um, technological advancements and uh, supporting buildings and institutions like that that help those that need it. Thank you so much. Neil Gray, it must be a huge issue for government. How are we going to kind of like close this long wait gap? Yeah, policy speed dating. Um, so Edinburgh, High, Edinburgh um, Eye Hospital Pavilion, we've made an absolute commitment that that is going to get rebuilt. Um, on um, ensuring that we have a recovery uh, in the health service, we are committing to uh, increasing the health budget by 20% over the course of the next parliament, increasing mental health budget uh, by 25%. Uh, we were, uh, we've got record but, levels. But that, doesn't cut, that doesn't cut, you know, it's, it's like, how, what do you do? about the waiting times, you know, is, is there going to be a real push on that? Yes, absolutely. That's going to be a part of the uh, recovery plan that is uh, going to be implemented for the health service and in particular for uh, the mental health services as well. Um, in relation to Laura's question around uh, autism, I absolutely sympathise and agree in my, my area in North Lanarkshire. It's a real challenge, uh, both in terms of diagnosis and in terms of support at school. Uh, so I think we've got to have a real uh, grown-up conversation about how we support um, children uh, and their families uh, with additional support needs, particularly uh, those uh, with autistic spectrum disorder. Yeah, thank you so much. And um, Jeremy Balfe, uh, um, yeah, what would you yeah, be doing? I mean, very quickly, Penny, three quick points. Uh, firstly, in regard to the Eye Hospital, yes, we made a commitment in our manifesto to build a new one. Uh, Neil may correct me later on, but I thought the First Minister had committed to a refurbishment, which is not a rebuild, but uh, if I'm wrong on that, no doubt he can tell me later. Uh, secondly, we've committed to put £2 billion extra into the NHS. That will be targeted at getting waiting lists down. They were large before the pandemic. We are now very large, and we need to deal with that quickly. Uh, and thirdly, there was an excellent private members bill in regard to transition from school um, on to what's next for children with disabilities. Uh, I hope if I'm elected, um, then I, along with other MSPs cross party, can pick that bill up again, get it into law, because that will give parents and children much bigger rights um, around that, um, Thank you. particularly when we're leaving school. Thank just you to very be clear, much. Just, There's just so be... much to cover. Can I just come back in very briefly and say we've got to give our note takers a break. We've got <laughs> eight minutes until four o'clock. 
Can we come back and pick it up then? Because yeah, it was just to say, it, it, it was just to say in response to Jeremy's point, we are committed in our manifesto to replacing the eye hospital at Pavilion. Thank you. That's good clarification. Apologies for trying to stop you giving that. We'll hopefully have time for accessible formats later. But meanwhile, please take a break. Come back at four o'clock. Thank you. Hello everyone and welcome back. We're ready to start this whip cracking um, discussion some more. I think we have everybody here again, do we? Yeah, hi. Okay, so before the break we were talking about health and social care. We're now going to pick up our second theme which is about rights and accessibility. And I've been given permission to lose some of the questions that have been submitted so that we create time for you to give us some answers. I'm sure that will come as uh, good news to you. So thank you. Um, our first question uh, comes from David Weir of the National Autistic Society. David, are you there? Hi, Peter, yeah. Hi. Hi there, so at the National Autistic Society of Scotland we have been campaigning with Enable and Scottish Autism as part of our right, sorry, our voice, our right, calling for a commissioner to protect the rights of autistic people and people with a learning disability and then they, and then they struggle to get support. There are commissioners for mental health but not autism and a learning disability. I think it is I think it will make a big difference because it gives a, vo a voice and protects rights. Do you support the campaign? Thank you. Do you have any thoughts, David, about how, who you would like to answer that question first? It's your choice, mate. I think we should actually get the Conservatives first. <laughs> okay, Jeremy Balfour, it's you. you're on. Uh, uh, thank you, David, and thank you for choosing me first. Um, Okay, um, let me be absolutely honest. Um, we go with politicians say match. Um, we don't support a commissioner. Um, I have done um, quite a number of these hosting meetings with different third sector charities and with different disabilities. And the, the common call from all of them have been, can we have a commissioner? And I, and I just think we could end up with quite a few commissioners here and it could just become a, a wee bit bureaucratic, a wee bit talking. So, um, the answer is we would look at the issue if we were in government to see how we can get the voters with disabilities voice better because as I said, I think having somebody within government as a minister would help do that. Um, but I'm not going to you know, try to duck the question. We wouldn't commit to a commissioner uh, for us, but we would look to give more money to the third sector to have that voice. Thank you. Neil Gray, um, Commissioner, Minister, both? It's certainly uh, a Commissioner. I mean, we haven't uh, formed the next uh, government yet, so I don't know about um, if you the First to. Minister's plans. Um, <laughs> if we do, if we are fortunate enough to fo uh, form the next government, and I'll be up to uh, whoever is First Minister to decide on ministerial titles. But certainly, uh, and I thank David for that question, um, yes, we absolutely... Uh, support the creation of a, a commissioner for people with autism and learning difficult uh, disabilities. Um, the Our Voice, Our Right campaign has been a, a cracking campaign. Um, it's also um, helped to inform some of the work uh, that I've done as the deputy convener of the Social Justice and Fairness Commission, which is looking at making Scotland a fairer place now under devolution, but also looking towards an independent Scotland. Uh, we haven't reported as yet. The report's completed, but it's not been published. Uh, and that is one of the areas that we have included in there as well. So, uh, yeah, really important to give voice uh, to uh, people with learning uh, disabilities and uh, autism. And we absolutely support the creation of such a commissioner. Thank you. Gillian Mackay. We certainly commit to looking into this with, in conjunction with um, disabled people's organisations. More, we absolutely support the point that more, um, more has to be done for people with disabilities and for autism and for people with um, learning disabilities. And I think that needs to take more 
of a centre stage within any government portfolio um, in the next session. So we definitely commit to working with disabled people's organisations, both on this and on funding for them in general. Thank you. And John Waddell, would you, do you support Commissioner? Do you think there should be a Minister? Is it either or? I don't think it's either or, although I do think there'd be a lot of overlap if we did have both. Um, we are committed to looking into the Commissioner and considering it on its merits, and the important thing to consider there is how it would work. And without drawing back to much more we are talking about before, this stuff again comes down to what kind of um, consideration is taken into and what evidence that they have and how they do their gathering, and then most importantly whether they're listened to. I do think a focal point within Parliament, uh, we don't have enough, um, to my knowledge, we don't have any autistic MSBs, um, and we don't have any kind of focal point to draw these from. So I think the points that Jeremy makes about a minister or whether the merits of a commissioner are all completely valid. Um, but we would look into exactly what the best way of doing that to make sure that they are they have the proper evidence gathering and then that they're listened to by the government is all is all taken on properly. And then Pam Duncan Glancy, you know, if it was Labour in power, what approach would you be taking to this question? So we, um, we, we, support, we support the campaign for an Autism and Learning Disability Commissioner. Um, I think it's incredibly important that we do that, not least because of the way that people with learning disabilities have been treated through the pandemic. We really need that focus um, for people. I actually think that we also need um, a, a disabilities commissioner, actually, because all of the all of the um, impairments that we have, um, we're, we're all united um, in the, the fact that we all face oppression and need our equality. So actually, I think we should have a commissioner for disabled people um, that would look across various different portfolios to support the, the disability and uh, equality and human rights of all people in Scotland. Um, but yes, we have committed specifically in our manifesto um, to an autism and learning disability commissioner. On the point about um, having people in Parliament representing people with autism. Um, Daniel Johnson, who's an excellent, um, one of our excellent MSPs um, for the Labour Party, uh, has, has Asperger's and has been a champion, I think, for neurodiverse people um, in Parliament. And, and it's important, I think, to recognise that because it's always, um, it's always easy to kind of go under the radar because people don't necessarily know if you can't see it. Um, so I think it is important to, to say, to recognise it and to congratulate, to congratulate for him for his work in that area. Thank you very much. And now there's a related question. It's additional and it's, it's directed at uh, Jeremy Balfour. Um, it comes from Ivan Cohen of Enable Scotland. And Ivan's basically saying, OK, in the absence of a commissioner, what will you do to make sure that the human rights of uh, people who have a learning disability and autistic people are respected in Scotland? I wonder if you could respond to that very briefly, Jeremy. I'm sorry, Ivan, it's got to be brief. Yeah, I mean, I think... I you know, without going over old ground, I mean, I think the other area that I've had the privilege of chairing for five years is the cross-party group on disability. Um, I would hold my hand up and say, I'm not sure we've been particularly proactive enough around that. We've started to do more with that group. Um, it's got a good cross-party representation on it. Uh, and I think there are many on this call who have been to it. Um, I think that group can be much more of a voice into Scottish government. Um, whoever takes that over. And I also think, um, you know, I would pay, I would agree with Pam that people like Daniel, um, Ollie Mundell has got, um, from Conservatives, has got dyslexia. These type of MSPs being there can advocate their own experience in a much clearer way. And that's why I think we need more disabled MSPs in Parliament who can actually verbalise it on the, on the chamber, what goes on. Thank you. I'm going to pick up a question from Terry Robinson of RNIB Scotland. The question is, what measures would the parties take to guarantee the human rights of people with sight loss to safe streets and accessible voting? I mean, it's coming down to, you know, being able to go into your voting booth. So sight loss, safe streets, and accessible voting. I wonder if I could go to Gillian first on that one. So this is this is partly why I love doing these events because you find out from many other people what um, problems they are facing with their oh. disabilities, and it's always a way to broaden your own broaden your own knowledge. Um, on safer, ultimately, we need input from people with sight loss. Um, as to what they need to be able to access both safe streets and accessible voting. Yeah, 
Thank lived you. experience is, al is always one of the most important things. Yeah. And that's a really important point to make, that this is a learning curve as well, that people are, are, I mean, I was surprised that voting might be an issue. Were you, John Waddell? Uh, actually, I, I was, and just, despite being partially sighted myself, but um, having heard from other people, I'm always actually just staggered to find out basically the different ways that impact people. My one is partially sighted on my right hand side. And when that impacted me a couple of years ago, it was the kind of more awareness and spatial awareness that I lost and the depth of field of vision. And I, I just, I'd never imagined that being a thing. So since meeting with other people with similar issues, I think the safest presumption to make is that any kind of disability and with sight loss in particular, there's no limit to how it could impact you. And um, when it comes to understanding, I think, you know, the, the, the kind of materials that you're using, um, thinking about leaflets, for example, I'm a Liberal Democrat, so we, we probably deliver more leaflets than anyone else because we're obsessed with it. But we aren't, haven't found any way of making that accessible to everyone beyond uh, online resources and making plain text things. So when it comes to the participating in democracy with sight loss, there's, there's no limit to the things okay. that we could do to improve. Thank you very much. Neil Gray, you were nodding there. You know, did it come to us as a surprise to you that, that there may be challenges in actually going to vote? If you're yeah, I mean, uh, you know, John's experience there and others' experiences of their own uh, lived uh, disability and how that impacts their lives. Uh, it's, uh, as uh, Gillian was saying, it's a learning experience for all of us all of the time, which is why it's so important to uh, listen and to hear about how uh, people's disabilities impact them uh, in so many um, aspects of life. In terms of being able to vote, I mean, I don't know if it's going to uh, cover the particular person in, 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 can, uh, that's asked the question, but there are uh, large print ballot papers, there are um, a tactile voting devices that can help uh, and assist at the ballot paper at the, at the polling station in, in terms of being able to assist um, and uh, I know also that the guide dogs are also uh, wanting, uh, guide dogs for the blind are also looking for uh, yeah. people when they're voting and taking their guide dogs into the polling station to take a photo outside with the hashtag uh, to say that they have done so. Um, so I think, uh, yeah, and in terms of uh, safer streets, uh, obviously uh, pavement parking has been banned uh, in Scotland, but certainly if there's more specific areas um, that might help in terms of making uh, th this uh, safer for people walking with their guide dogs or with partial uh, sightedness, uh, then certainly I'd, I'd be all ears in terms of listening to see what m more could be done. Thank you, Pam. Are you, you know, is, is this something that you're aware? I mean, safe streets, safe streets for people with sight loss, for instance, and that's specifically what this question is about: safe streets and sight loss. Yeah, um, sadly, I'm not surprised to hear any of this. Um, I'm. I'm gutted to hear it um, because it's been going on for far too long. It's 2021. We've had disabled people um, around for a long, long time. Um, and we represent 20% of the population. So it's it's pretty grim that this is still the situation. Um, and street furniture, for example, is another, another area where disabled people tend to not have um, their voices heard. So we all know that in, in democracies, the loudest voices um, the loudest voices usually win out and ultimately unless um, you that is the default that kind of default ends up in inequalities being baked into the system and unless you fix that by design so using things like specific um, positive action to get disabled people onto boards or get disabled people on councils or on planning committees and um, then you're never ever going to readdress that and um, so to make sure that we did that it's all it's all good and well to have things like experience panels and um, but we also need to have action panels and getting people um, in the room where where they can make the decisions and um, on the, the point about voting and um, again this doesn't surprise me but it reminds me of um, uh, an MSP who said to me once um, God this is terrible the experience of disabled people why do I not know how bad it is and I said because you can't get out of bed in the morning to come and tell you because social care is so bad so it doesn't surprise me that voting is still inaccessible to too many people it's disgusting it's a fundamental human right and we can't call ourselves a proper democracy until we fix it which is why we have to have new support in polling stations we need information like polling cards in accessible formats and we need um, to, to look at audio solutions as well um, and i know that some polling stations do that um, and some polling stations are accessible, but not all. And not all of them are accessible to people in wheelchairs either. And a lot of people assume they are. We've got a long, yeah. long way to go. Gosh, OK, thank you so much. And, and again, Jeremy, um, you know, pretty grim still, uh, according to Pam. Would you agree with that? Well, well, well Penny, uh, things have got better in the last couple of years. Um, there was a bill going through in four elections 
uh, in the last uh, couple of years, just two years ago, put through by the Scottish Government, um, I, along with Labour um, and the SNP, moved amendments uh, to make um, some trials more available over the next um, um, by-elections, which will make it easier. Now, I know it didn't go as far as RNIB wanted it to go, but I think with these trials, it's five years away, but in five years' time, I hope every individual will be able to vote without the assistance of anybody else. Uh, and I think there's a, actually a commitment from all the main parties um, around that. So um, we're not there yet, but we have made progress even in the last couple of years. And I would actually pay credit to the SNP and to Labour on this. The three of parties worked pretty well on that, uh, and we made some progress. In regard to um, accessibility, yeah, I find this the most frustrating thing um, in regard to cluttered on the streets, in regard to disability bays being taken away, in regard to parking, all that kind of thing. Um, and I just think we need to have a much stronger voice. Uh, I think we need an access panel in every local authority area, and we need that access panel to be funded and equipped in a way that it can advocate on behalf of disabled rights. So uh, I, I think we've also got to be careful in regard to accessing more cycling and closing roads and all that kind of area, because it's often, again, the disabled people that are affected by that and their voice is simply not heard. Thank you very much. We've got a couple more uh, big questions that we, we probably haven't got the time to go to, but in order to put them on your radars as politicians, I'd like to just run through them for you. One is from Mary Douglas of the MS Society who says, as a result of the pandemic, there's been a move to online service provision in both the NHS and the third sector. Uh, how would the panel tackle digital poverty and ensure that nobody is disadvantaged if they're unable to access high speed broadband, don't have access to digital services or don't have the confidence or skills to engage in online service provision. We may get the time to pick that up. The second point comes from Tina Yu of Sense Scotland, who says, many people, many disabled people rely on public transport for day-to-day -day living and essential purposes. However, more and more bus operators cancel bus routes after they've received subsidized income or the route is non-profitable. It's a familiar story, isn't it? Transport system is complicated where the equipment and lines, roads are maintained by different organizations. It also makes complaining very difficult as well. This results in inaccessible transport, both functionally and operationally. How would your party ensure accessible transport for all? I don't know whether, actually, do you know what? Those subjects are so important. I'm going to come round you all again and say, right, two points. Digital access. How do we deal with digital poverty? It's a human right, surely, to be online now increasingly. And then what on earth do we do about joined up transport? Pam. Can you make it like really tabloid answer? <laughs> yeah, so two out of 15 stations um, in Glasgow are accessible, but we um, NASA oh. advertised a couple of months ago to put a disabled person on the moon. So I could go to the moon, but I couldn't go to the other side of the yeah. city, which is pretty grim. Um, so what I think we need to do is take profit out of transport, um, nationalise buses and railways, um, and then use the, all the powers and arms of government that we have to make them build them accessibly. Thank you. Um, Neil, could you answer just as succinctly, but I'm going to ask you, you know, is this on your radar? Yes, it is. I asked a question at this uh, at Westminster in my time when I was there because there is a shared responsibility here in terms of um, the um, ensuring public transport is accessible, particularly in the railways um, with uh, net network rail uh, being reserved. So I've, I, I is on my radar. It's something I've asked about and, and sought uh, commitments from. Uh, in terms of uh, digital poverty and exclusion, um, the SNP is committed to a £200 million uh, uh, Connecting Scotland fund, which will uh, help to um, ensure that people who have previously been uh, digitally excluded, uh, 300,000 households, 800,000 people um, will be supported with uh, devices, uh, training etc. Thank you. Gillian, this must be right up the Greens <laughs> agenda here. Only a little bit. <laughs> um, accessibility to actually even get to public transport in some places mm -hmm. is really difficult. Thinking of my own area in Falkirk, we, uh, the bus station was closed um, a few years ago and now the 
the access to the main place where the buses terminate mm. now has either quite an incline or steps to access it. There's no room for social distancing, all these sorts of things. So there's lots that we need to do on both joined up transport and obviously nationalising the rail service is huge, but looking at um, the ever extending of um, bus routes that are consolidated into one another is, is massive. Um, ensuring that on public transport, parents with buggies and disabled people are not pitted against each other is something is something else that I think we really need to work on in the design of our transport system. Yeah, thank you. And uh, Jeremy, from from your perspective as a Scottish Conservative, you know, this digital poverty and, you know, privatised buses. Uh, well, if we can take the digital stuff first, I mean, I think absolutely we need to make sure that the internet is rolled out more better. But I think someone just put in the chat, and I think it's a really important comment. Not everybody is able to use digital technology. And we yeah. just have to be careful that we don't move and then exclude people for whatever reason, whatever their disability is, that actually what they prefer is speaking to a person or being able to go and see somebody face to face. You know, I'm uh, you know, old enough still not to like technology. I much prefer still going to my bank and seeing a proper face. And I think actually other people feel the same. So we just want to be careful on that. In, in, in regard to yeah. accessible transport, I, mean, I, I, I would actually point to somebody like, like Lothian Buses, again in Edinburgh, who um, have done a pretty good job in regard Built to publicly that. owned. Uh, owned well, by Glasgow, Edinburgh City it's Council. It's owned by the council. It's owned by yeah. the council. But my, my big, and you get bored of me, I know Penny's getting bored of me saying this, because I say yeah. every meeting, my grudge is not also with public transport, but it's getting to the public transport. We need decent pavements, we need different, decent roads, we need to give local authorities more money to fix for potholes and yeah. to fix for pavements so I can get to a bus stop in the first place. Good point, thank you. Um, Eddie Mackay has put a note in chat saying, and it's in caps, so it's a shout, when did the law about parking on pavements come into force? Um, uh, John, what's your response to, to, not necessarily Eddie's point, but pick that up if you wish, but this digital poverty, and if you could make it really short, and public transport? Really short. Not yeah. that I was in Parliament. I think it was at the start of this Parliament, and it should have started being implemented halfway through, not that it's being implemented effectively. Uh, in terms of the digital poverty, um, I think it's a very good point. We want to roll out broadband to um, all rural and lower income areas um, that haven't reached it yet. But equally for those who don't want to use the internet, we want to create a single through ticketing system for buses, trains and ferries. So uh, with uh, reopening some of the lines that were cut by the beaching cuts um, and make sure that we're reopening railway stations that they'll be accessible for those who need it. Um, and the uh, sort of final point to make about that, um, um, Oh, I've completely lost uh, a train of thought on that one. Uh, but yes, we, we want to uh, reopen some of the beaching cards and make sure that railway lines are accessible for those who are attending. Okay, really interesting. And we can find out more information, I think, from the, the party manifestos. And there's a link in the chat box to how you can, how you can get hold of those because you can read into this in greater detail. Now we're going to move on to our third and final theme for the day, which is social security and employment. I mean, each one of these subject areas could be a hustings on their own, which is why this one's so, it's covering a lot of ground. Our first question on this particular issue is put by Kat Johnson of the MS Society. Kat, are you there? Hi, welcome. You're on mute. <laughs> Too easy done. Is that, is that ah, okay? you're on. Good, I can hear you. Thank you. Sorry about that. Don't and um, thank you very much for having me on to ask a question. So social security is being devolved in Scotland. And while progress has been made, people with disabilities still face substantial barriers to accessing the financial support they need to live well. Will you support the scrapping of the 20 metre rule, which sets a baseless measure for the highest level of mobility support in the new system? If not, how can people feel, as the Scottish Government has promised, that they are being treated with dignity, fairness and respect? Thank you. Thank you. I'd like to come to you first on that, John Waddell. 
I think it's a really good question um, and that we shouldn't have arbitrary measurements that aren't suitable um, for people when it comes to assessment. Obviously, we need to have assessments to make sure that the support is uh, suitable for the, the needs of the person. But having assessments that are anxiety inducing, arbitrary and not suitable for the very conditions that they're assessing aren't, aren't suitable. So I do agree that we should get rid of the 20 metre rule. Um, and we should have a much more, um, first of all, localised system, but second of all, one that respects the individual needs of the people who are being assessed, um, if only so that we make sure that the services that are being provided um, is actually suitable for the individual, as opposed to um, arbitrary national uh, anxiety reducing and quite frankly, careless system. Yeah, thank you. Neil uh, Gray, um, you know, this, it causes such a lot of distress. I've been speaking to so many disabled people that, that find the stress associated um, with these assessments are just dreadful. Is there something you could do about changing it? Yeah, absolutely. And I, and I thank Kat, not just for her question, but for the campaigning that she's done on this issue over a long period of time. It's It really is an arbitrary um, cut-off that is, it doesn't match up with the individual needs-based um, assessment that should be getting carried out. Um, and that's why we have committed in uh, the, the new social security disability benefits that the Scottish Government will be responsible for. The assessments will be based on uh, paper-based medical notes uh, in the first instance, and it will not, uh, it will be, that will be by default and only face-to-face -face assessments if it is necessary or requested. Um, because the assessment criteria for PIP and DLA has been totally demeaning, uh, provides uh, a, a huge anxiety um, and uh, has actually worsened people's health. Um, so, yes, I support a complete overhaul in the way that the assessment process works. Uh, the 20 metre rule has got to be part of that consideration. It's just, I, mean, I, I just can't see uh, how that uh, would work on a proper needs based, rights based um, uh, system. And uh, I, um, again, thank uh, Kat, the MS Society and so many others for the work that they've done. I've uh, championed that at Westminster when I was a DWP spokesperson as well, uh, and we'll keep up uh, that work and that effort. Thank you. Now, the, I'm going to go to Pam Duncan Glancy next, but I'm going to pull in a, 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 a question from Ian Brown of RNIB Scotland that's related to this, who says that, um, you know, these regulations uh, require people to undergo periodic reassessment. Would candidates support granting them ongoing entitlement unless effective treatment becomes available? Pam, I heard you say that you thought these assessments were really unfair. You know, what would you do about this? Would you would you say, look, there are some people, it's just like, that's it, you're entitled. Absolutely. Um, and, and we said that in our manifesto. I was really proud yesterday to launch, uh, sorry, Tuesday, time's moving fast, uh -huh. to launch our social security recovery plan. And in that, we commit specifically to ending the 20 metre rule. But we also say we'll end the 50% rule because the 50% rule blocks so many people with fluctuating conditions out of being able to access um, disability assistance and I think it's essential that, that we get on top of this and fast and um, the systems that are that are in place just now are toxic we heard um on a, we, we spoke to one person on Tuesday who said that she was she'd gone for her assessment and she was asked how often she changed her underwear I mean, oh. why on earth that yeah. is that is a decent question to ask anyone and what on earth it tells any assessor anything um, about how much money you need to live, I've no idea. Um, so we would fundamentally reform how we do social security, but we would do it quickly and soon because it's regrettable that we haven't started to address that yet. Um, and I understand that the pandemic has taken um, a lot of time and resource, but this has been going on now for far too long and we've got the powers in Scotland to do this differently. And um, we need to do, we need to use it. On the point about assessments, we would make sure that the people that were doing the assessments also understood um, the, the lived experience that the person they're assessing has. So for example, if you were presenting um, that on the phone or through written evidence, um, a, a mental health condition, you wouldn't necessarily be assessed by a physio. And um, you, would, you would get someone who actually knew um, your, your condition so that that would be another, another call that you hear very strongly from people that have to go through that process. Jeremy, you were reacting quite strongly there. What, are you for this idea um, that, that people might just be kind of granted they don't have to do the assessments anymore? They are yep, yep. disabled. Yeah, I mean, thanks for the question, Kat. Um, can I come to that firstly? Yeah, I mean, I think if someone's got a condition which is clearly lifelong, 
So, you know, if I draw two arms, the Daily Record will report it and DWP will know about it quick enough. You know, I can't see no reason why I should be assessed. So, yeah, if you've got a condition such as mine, then clearly you should be for life. Um, I, I disagree with John. I don't think we want a localised system. Um, you know, I think we want a system that is fair across the, the, the postcodes and we want a system that is uh, fair across the whole of Scotland. The Scottish Government have put out for consultation their view on PIP and that is to keep the 20 yard rule um, in it. Um, and that is also what the Cabinet Secretary has said to me on a number of occasions in Parliament. I do think we need some kind of standard understanding for mobility. Uh, for 20 odd years, I sat as a tribunal member on PIP and DLA, and I can see at least one or two uh, present members. And if you're making an assessment, you need to make the assessment on something. So whether it's 20 yards or 50 yards, or can you walk, walk the length of a football pitch, that decision has to be made so that there's consistency throughout Scotland. And I think it will be a, a debate that we have going forward when these regulations come to Parliament in the next year or so as to how that is done. Is it a distance? But we also have to remember it's not just distance, it's time, speed and manner. So all these things have to be looked at when we're deciding if someone is virtually able to work. And, and I, I also agree just finally with Pam in regard to the 50% rule. Um, particularly for people with epilepsy and with those who have um, a disability which is um, variable, the 50% rule is really difficult. And, and I think we have to look at that. Um, but we need some kind of understanding of what is it that gets you into that highest Thank rate. You. Right. Um, um, but what is an issue? Thank you. There's some really interesting comments coming into chat. Alan Stewart is saying, Gillian, I'm coming to you next. I'm blind and at my PIP assessment, I was asked how my shirt was so well pressed. You know, what can we do to change this situation? What would you do? What would the Greens do in a nutshell? I think... I'm going to have to disagree with Jeremy because he absolutely he acknowledged that in the 50% rule, variable disabilities are something that should be considered. In the 20 meter rule, variable disabilities are something that should be recognised as well. On I'm sure people on some people's good days, 20 meters is absolutely fine. On other days, it's absolutely not. I have a I have a variable hearing loss, so absolutely understand how from day to day variable hearing losses, variable um, disabilities are are something that, that are that variable and can change from assessment to assessment and from day to day. The, the shirt, somebody's just commented, the shirt comment enraged me. It enraged me when I read it as well. The prejudice that is at the heart of some of these assessments is incredible. The judgment made on how people present in daily life and in these assessments is something that absolutely has to be tackled. And that's something that we need to do within the next parliament as well. We need to, there are many disabled candidates who have either visible or invisible disabilities and challenging those prejudices and challenging those those assumptions about what disabled people can and cannot do has to come from disabled people's representation at all levels of public life, not just in this election, on boards, on councils, everywhere. And that's something that we really need to work on and that we need to get into the heart of this, um, the social security system at large as well. Thank you. Pam Duncan Gladsey, you had your hand up to come in there, did you? Oh, no, sorry, it was quiet. Oh, it's all right, it's fine, it's fine. Um, and uh, Neil Gray, I saw you looking like you were going to blow a gasket there a minute ago but I don't know whether you want back in for a very brief. I, I, I just find uh, some of Jeremy's comments incredible given the situation that many disabled people on this call today and uh, constituents of mine that have faced over the last six years in terms of yep. the PIP and ESA assessments, the degrading system, I just Can I just it. interject here? People can make up their own minds about that. I'm going to huckle us on through an agenda that uh, is very packed. 
Uh, here's a comment from Sandra Wilson of RNIB, who are a question actually from Sandra. How would you, what would you do to address the difficulties that blind and partially sighted and disabled people face in getting employment? A huge and critical question. Um, uh, uh, I wonder whether I could go to, I'm trying to shake up the order every time. Does anybody particularly want to start us off on this? In which case, stick your hand up and get going. Oh, great. Okay. Take it away. John Waddell. If the pandemic has shown us absolutely anything at all, it's that flexible work arrangements have always been possible and employers have simply been reticent to, to use them. So we now know entirely possible. I mean, in fact, when I go back to work in an office, whenever that happens, and if I say, look, it'd be really helpful to, for me to work from home on a Thursday or Friday, the employer should hopefully be in a place where they can't say, why do you need to do that? Or how are you going to do that? Like I've had it in previous jobs. So it's incredibly obvious now that the flexible work arrangements that we've had over the last year have always been possible and are not an insurmountable challenge. So we need to encourage employers to make that an, a, an easy thing to do and make it completely normalized. Whenever someone has to, you know, whether it be travel from Glasgow to Edinburgh to do a job or whether it's about moving around and the requirements of the job are unsuitable for them, it's actually entirely possible for them to work from home. So we need to encourage employers to make it easy and accessible for people to work from home if they want to, but also get that balance that's going to work for them, whether it's about their mental health, whether it's about their vision and they have accessible documents, or whether it's simply about a matter of getting a, a life balance that is suitable to their energy levels, whatever it may be, it's entirely possible. But we need to make sure that when we come out of this pandemic, we don't lose this hybrid system that we've put together, and that should hopefully make it available for everyone to get into work, and that the barriers that have been put up in place unnecessarily for decades are removed. Thank you. Gillian, um, the uh, questioner was really about how, how do we address the barriers to actually getting employment? Uh, so it's a slightly different issue once you've got your job and you know ha what accommodations have to be made, but actually getting into the jobs market in the first place, what is the Greens' big ideas for that? I think for young people, ensuring that um, disabled young people are not left behind by the Young Persons Guarantee and that they are, they have an accessible way into that system is something that's massive. I benefited from um, one of the Inclusion Scotland internships for um, disabled people back in 2014 now. That seems like a, an awful long time ago now. Um, these sorts of, these sorts of things are are very useful to getting into um, getting into employment and things, but ultimately we need to we need to ensure that uh, workplaces are accessible for disabled people. That the jobs in the first place. I mean, I recognise John's um, John's points, and I think you could bring that on to the very start of of the employment process. I'm always. I, I'm always slightly taken aback by by the term reasonable adjustment. Mm. Um, reason, reasonable adjustment makes it sound like employers are trying to do the bare minimum, where in actual fact, employers should actually be doing everything they can to ensure that their workers thrive. Pam made a very good point earlier on about the, the ingenuity and the creativity within the disabled community that we have to be innovators by design and that that creativity and that depth that knowledge the empathy within the disabled community in general is something massive that should be harnessed by employers but the the accessibility of jobs of workplaces of employment in the first place has to be pushed by employers themselves and I think any contracts that are given out by the Scottish Government have to ensure that these workplaces are accessible for disabled people and that they are making efforts to employ disabled people. I think that would be a really good start and actually a, a really a really good point from the government to take a lead in this and take a step forward. Thank you. Pam Duncan Glancy. I think it'll be really interesting to see how far the needle has moved on reasonable adjustment um, in the last year because um, 
excuse me, I lost my voice. It would be really hard to convince anyone right now that it was unreasonable to work from home. Um, yeah, I know that every single disabled person has asked for that and many, many, many have been told that's unreasonable. Right. Um, so yeah, they, I mean, the reasonable adjustment aspect of, of the equalities legislation has always been a bit of a bugbear of mine because reasonable is so subjective. Um, so what we would do to help more disabled people get into employment, um, well, first of all, we would guarantee a, a job for every disabled person who wanted one and could work. Um, and as part of that, we would do that in the public sector. And as part of that, we would provide 20 hours um, at least of training or more, um, so that, uh, which would be paid so that um, they, they would be able to progress their career further. We'd look to extend those um, targeted jobs to the third sector as well in the future. Um, and ultimately, it's about what else we do um, across society too, because um, it's obviously we need to fix um, things in the workplace. So we need to use positive action, like enforcing um, through procurement, through business support, through business support pledges that we've um, that we'll ask people to sign up to to say that they will do this. We need to set targets. Um, we can't leave this to accident because accident ends up with inequalities. We have to, I've said it before, I'll say it again, we have to fix it by design. But we also have to sort out social care so that you can get out of bed in the morning and get to work. We have to short, sort out housing so that you can leave your house and go to work. Or indeed, I suppose you could work at home, but you know you know the the point there is your house needs to be accessible as well and of course transport too there's a lot to be done there's a reason why half of us are not in employment and it's not because we're not able to do it or because we don't have um the innovation um, or the, the ingenuity to be there it's because of the systemic discrimination that exists across society thank you jeremy balfour what would the conservatives do to support uh disabled people to get into employment yeah, I mean, I, I think of all the issues, this is one of one of the key ones. Um, in my opinion, and it's just my opinion, of all the kind of protected characteristics, disability is probably the furthest behind of all of them, and particularly around employment. Um, I sat down two or three years ago with four or five of the big companies, institutions in Scotland, and they all recognise the need to have more disabled people within their workforce, but of all the uh, protected characters, it's, it's one that they struggled with most. Um, and I think that's an interesting societal issue. And, and that's why I think I agree with Pam that absolutely we need to have all the things that people have talked about, but actually we, we need an education of um, how society sees disability. And that's a much bigger piece of work, which I think can be done actually cross party once we get out of this election because I think a lot of it we can agree on. In specifically, um, we have committed, um, as I said in my opening statement, that we would have, uh, we would set up a new company wholly owned by Scottish yeah. government. Why, why a company? Because, well, you could do it in many ways. It, 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 it's a legal identity. You need something. Yeah, yeah you don't have to explain it. It's, it's a legal terminology. <laughs> um, you can call it whatever you want. But the, but the basis of that would be to get people, to help people into employment so that they have the skills they can learn, that they can get the whole work at, at thing. It, it's worked in Scandinavia. I think it can work here in Scotland. And the other thing is- I mean, I We used to have things to... like that, didn't we? And then they didn't get funding and went out of business. Do you know what I mean? It's... Yeah. And, so, and, so, um, and, ultimately, and ultimately, you're right, Penny, it needs to be funded. And yeah. we put money behind this, so yeah. it will be funded and people will be able to use it. Thank you. Neil Gray, last word on this one before we go into our- home run yes uh, so there's a number of things here first of all on john's point around um ensuring the flexibilities that we've cut we've enjoyed during the pandemic can be maintained i think that's an important point but also employment law is currently reserved um so ensuring that the protections are that are in place there to ensure that people aren't exploited uh, by the acceleration of flexibility and work um, I think we have to be mindful of as well. I completely agree with John's point. This should hopefully help open the door to uh, many more people being able to access work because the expectations have changed. The point that Pam made about uh, reasonable adjustment uh, is, is a good one. Um, I, I would also say uh, the Access to Work Fund is one of the best kept secrets in Whitehall. You know, a fantastic 
um, uh, service to support employers to be able to make adjustments to the workplace to help uh, disabled people uh, to get access to work. Um, I, I think that needs to be publicised far, far better um, to ensure that employers can take advantage of it. Uh, we remain committed to having the disability employment gap. The UK government's dropped that commitment. We remain committed to doing that and we will um, do that by um, helping to double, nearly double the plan investment into the Parental uh, Employment Support Fund uh, will, um, as I said in my introduction, uh, expand specific duties that require listed public authorities to publish gender pay gap information, but also disability and ethnicity reporting to ensure that these areas are included within their equal pay statements. Shining a light on where there are discrepancies often ensure that these organisations do more uh, to meet the requirements that we would expect of them to ensure that there's a diversity in their workforce. Thank you. Now, because that are oh, so many issues that people want to talk about. You know, we haven't been able to really go into stigma and social attitudes, how we change those, um, to accessible information, which there has been a question about, to how do we reduce social isolation, which is a question that's come in from Penny Thomas of uh, Scottish Autism. But I am sadly looking at the clock. I wish we had more time. And it just, for me, shows just how much uh, disabled people's experience, their concerns and their issues need to be on right in the middle of the table as we go ahead. But I have my own closing question, if you will forgive me on this. Um, as we come to the end of this particular hustings panel, can I go round and ask our panelists, what have you learned today? You know, has there been has there been anything that you have learned today from your interaction with this and this is a large group of important charities working with disabled people. Gillian. I think what I've probably more consolidated in my learning is that you never stop learning about other people's disabilities and the barriers that other people face. Earlier on, I referenced sort of look, always finding out something new when we do these panels and I never I never fail to find that someone has another aspect of their disability that affects them in another way that I that I haven't considered and I think that's something that when we're making legislation and we're making policy that we need to we need to keep in mind that even though if we were elected even though we have experience of disability we don't have experience of every disability and the, the input of disabled people's organisations, disabled people generally, is something that is going to have to be embedded in the next parliament to ensure that we get the best legislation, the best policy, the best everything that benefits disabled people. Can I press you just about how you would do that differently? Because what I hear from people in the sector is they've heard so much of this before. There are so many promises made. You can't hold anybody to account when, you know, once an election's happened, they might conveniently forget they've made those promises. How would you do it differently as a Green? Well, you haven't had me in Holyrood before for a start, so I yeah, will come okay. back. You can, you can have me back, you can grill me, you can make me accountable. That is my promise to every single organisation on this call. I will be in there doing things differently, working cross-party with all the other disabled MSPs that will be elected. Working with the disabled candidates who are not elected as well equally as importantly because they have experience just as much as the rest of us do. So my my challenge is very much watch this space and watch what we can do. Thank you and Jeremy Balfour I'm going in the order that people are on my screen right now all right so if anybody wants to get me on <laughs> I'm not, not giving everybody a fair chance. Forgive me for that. Jeremy Balfour, two questions there, uh, you know, really important ones. What's your response? Yeah, I, I mean, I think for me, the answer to your question is um, hidden disability is often forgotten about. And I think we've got to keep remembering that. And I agree with Gillian. Just because I have my disability doesn't mean that I understand everyone else's disability. You know, I don't have any visual impairment. I don't have any hearing loss. 
John and Gillian have that. I don't. Um, so we need to keep learning from other people. And so, secondly, I think as an MSP, and no doubt ever can put my chat if it's not true, I have met with almost all every organisation that's here today, and my pledge would be to continue to keep dialoguing with as many of the third sector, with many individuals as possible. I'm going to press you though. Can I come back to you? What have, what have you personally learned today, if anything, or maybe maybe it was all stuff you've heard before? And then I'd like to pick up this issue of accountability. How do we hold politicians to account once they've won the votes, once they're in the big hoose at the bottom of the Royal Mile? How do we hold them to account for what they've said? Well, I think, I mean, I think don't just hold these events every five years. Mm -hmm. Hold these events on a more regular basis. Okay. So if Neil, Gillian, John, Pam and whoever is me all get elected, have us back in a year's time, say to Neil, you said that. Why have you not delivered it? Um, okay. Or say the same to Gillian. Um, and also, you know, I do think there's actually a, a pretty good... Um, I actually do think the third sector of our disability charities are good at engaging with politicians across party. Come along to the cross party group that will be formed. I'm sure all the members here will be welcome to come along. We do it online. You don't have to come to Edinburgh. So, you know, come along, take part, hold us to account. And what have you learned? I'm going to come back to that. I'm not letting yeah, you know I, that. I, I mean, I think I do go back to that. I mean, I think it's really, I mean, I think the thing I've learned, I can't say just because I am disabled, I can talk for everybody. I need to say my disability affects me in this way, but it will affect Pam, John, Gillian, everybody else in a different way. Thank you very much. And John Waddell, for you. Um, I think what I've learned is what perhaps I've always hoped to be true, but that we all agree on more than we disagree on. Um, and the different experiences and the different perspectives that we got on this can all come together. And if we were all elected, then we could contribute to that cross party group that Jeremy was talking about. And we could bring those experiences in there. Um, and uh, ideally, even though we're all in different parties, different ideas in the constitution, different ideas even on disability, there is still more in that Venn diagram of overlap than there is disagreement. And that's something that we can use to benefit disabled people if we're all elected. But how I'd, how I'd implement that, I'm gonna, I'm gonna flip what Gillian said just a little bit. And I don't think it's just about us coming back to you, but it's about you coming to us. That in a year's time, what Jeremy said, well, you said you were gonna do this, how are you getting on about it? We need to get everyone, not just into the cross party groups, we should get everyone who's in this call into the, into the chamber, into the gallery, and make all the politicians who are in there turn around and look you in the eye and tell them, tell you what they're going to do to help you. Make them see the white of their eyes when they can tell you why we can't that. afford to do this, why we can't <laughs> afford to support you, and actually make them feel it um, when there is something to be done. And then what have you learned from today's interaction with this group of people? Uh, just what I said at the beginning, that I think yeah. um, I can work with Labour, Conservative, SNP and Green. Cross party, we can do Absolutely. this as a wanna. It's what I we think. always hope to be true, but actually hearing everyone talk about this, yeah. I, 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 did, we've actually said yeah, more. I'm not due to I, that, so. <laughs> <laughs> we, had a, we had a lot of, I agree with Gillian, I agree with Pam, I agree with Neil moments. Which is so very was, refreshing, I have to say. Neil Gray, is that pipe dream or reality? No, I think it is. I mean, that's definitely one of the things that I have learned today. The two real things that I take away is that there is... Uh, there are differences of opinion on a number of things, including some of the things we've been discussing today, but actually there is a, a, a huge amount that we do agree on. And actually, you know, I've been in discussions like this from a Westminster perspective, and actually the perspectives that we're talking here and now from a Hollywood perspective, I think there's far more agreement and um, collaboration um, that is going to come forward, which I find um, really refreshing from my last six years, I have to say. Um, also, what I've learned, um, I think, uh, around communication, actually, the, the, the question that there was around communication around vaccines from Kevin um, and ensuring that we, we have um, our communications in accessible formats for all. That's, it's a challenge because we've already talked about how diverse uh, the people's needs are, but that's definitely one of the takeaways. In terms of holding us to account, um, uh, Jeremy uh, tried to preempt the election result and say Neil will be held to account uh, for the commitments <laughs> that he's been made, uh, as, uh, assuming that the SNP will form the next government, which I take no assumption for. There's a lot of uh, hard work to go into the next two weeks. Um, but yeah, come, come back to us, have these regular roundtables um, uh, and, and discussions. Uh, come back to us on the commitments we've made in the manifesto, how far we are along with um, realising those. Um, and uh, keep talking to us, keep 
um, doing the stakeholder work that you do all so well. Um, and I look forward, hopefully, if the election goes our way at, and I can be an MSP, that I'll be able to be part of those stakeholder discussions. Thank you so much. Pam Duncan Glancy. Um, thank you. One of the things that I'm, I'm always a bit kind of funny about falling into travel, a lot of it's really, really hard to look people in the eye and say, I don't think disabled people should have equality. So often we do get so much agreement at these things because actually it does feel like the right thing to do. Where the disagreement comes is when you've had a lot of time in government to, to make the difference. Um, and there are there are, are two people, as, you, as, as we all know, represented here who are either in government and, and have had a lot of time to do it. So we have to use the powers that we have and the privilege that we have in government to really make a difference. And it genuinely is about um, putting our money where our mouths is. And I think that there is going to be a lot of cross-party agreement. And I can already actually see from this discussion today areas where if I was lucky to be enough to be um, elected to parliament, where I would be going, right, I'm going to go to this person on this issue because I think there's a cross-party thing to be done there. So that's really important. Um, what I've learned, uh, I've learned two things. Um, and, I, and I do think I have an understanding um, of the, the depth of oppression that disabled people face. And then I come to something again like this and I hear some of the experiences um, and the experience of, of Alan Sharp um, has just has just blown me away again. Um, and so I learn every day about how how deep um, the inequality disabled people face is. Um, and I also have learned that we've spoke a lot and I did it myself um, and, and, and we have to do it. We speak a lot about ensuring disabled people's voices are in the room and having experienced panels. But I genuinely actually think we're now going to need to move to a position where we have action panels because um, you said earlier on, Penny, about um, being right in the centre of the table. The, the truth is, if we're not around the table, we're on the menu. And that's what's happened for far, far too long. OK, now in the five minutes that are left to us and before I do all my thanks for finishing I'm going to run reverse styly back through that list and ask you in response to Ken Reid of RNIB Scotland who wrote a question that was skipped before it's more vital than ever that people with sight loss receive healthcare information in accessible formats and yet this still does not happen uh, how would you work to ensure progress is made here we haven't got time to answer his question but Pam Dandekin Glancy are you sure that your manifesto is available in all the formats it needs to be to make it accessible and I mean literally I'm talking a yes or no answer um, yeah thank you Neil Gray you've already confessed that I, I hope so I, I, I certainly think so I hope so thank you John Waddell you're gonna go and look at it again maybe it's not I know it's not it's not thank you Jeremy Balfour uh, sadly, I don't think I think we should be joined. I, I hoped it was, but it's not completely. Thank completely you. Forward. And finally, Gillian Mackay. I hope it is, but I can't remember off the top of my head. But I will come back to people if there is formats it's not in. I'm incredibly grateful for all of you on the panel bearing with us as we whip through some enormous subject areas in what feels like a very long time when you're starting it, but goes so fast. So thank you so much to our panel um, and uh, to all those who asked questions, who took the trouble to ask those questions. I hope you heard your questions reflected in our discussion and particularly to all of those who listened in and took part in this debate. And there's a fantastic chat feed there that I would very much like to be able to go back through, but I'm scrolling back up to the top and it's taken forever. So I can't go through it just now, but I will later. Thanks to all the charities that came together to organise this hustings. I'm going to name them again. National Autistic Society, Scottish Autism, MS Society Scotland, Enable Scotland, Lennon Cheshire Scotland, Sense Scotland, RNIB Scotland, Sight Scotland, and the Health and Social Care Alliance Scotland. Thanks too to our BSL interpreters, Helen Dunapace and Mark Cross, who've been absolutely magnificent throughout, and to um, uh, the uh, interpreters, Andrina McMenemy and Melanie Coulter, who've been generating coast captions. Stay alert for the possible TV, STV broadcast, possibly later this week. And please don't mm -hmm. forget to cast your vote on May the 6th. It matters. Thank you. <laughs>